All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Thinking It Through with Dr. Naidu, Child Psychiatrist. Today, we are speaking to Dr. Jacob Towery. He is a pediatric psychiatrist, a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and at the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, our annual um, conference that we have at ACAP, I saw that he was actually listed as the Meet the Author, and I was super excited because I actually picked up his book a couple years ago when I was trying to figure out how to really help teens with avoiding medication. And the reason why I was so interested in the book is because it's called The Antidepressant Book. I think it's a fantastic name. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that book because I spend so much time taking care of suicidal youth. I know a lot of listeners here also are parents of kids with mental health conditions. And I think all of us want to try to avoid meds if we can. Dr. Towery is the author of this book. He has also been in private practice for over a decade, working as a psychiatrist to help many people, including lots of depressed teens. So he shares his wisdom in this book and with us today. He finished his child and adolescent fellowship training at Stanford, where he also serves as an adjunct faculty. And I'm so excited to talk to him about his insights about this book, his work that he continues to do every day um, as a child psychiatrist. So welcome to this episode of Thinking It Through with Dr. Naidu, Child Psychiatrist, Who Needs Meds? The Antidepressant Book with Dr. Jacob Towery. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Shivana. It's good to be here with you. Awesome. Is there anything you want to add before we start? Uh, I want to give credit to my friend John Burton, who came up with the title of the book. I uh, just put out like a little survey on Facebook, and I was like, I have an okay title, but I don't think it's that great. If anyone comes up with a better title, I'll give him a prize. And he came up with it, and I was like, I like that title. Awesome. So, of course, I want to start by thanking you for writing this book and kind of giving us not just a guideline, but manual and engaging way to just really give us an example to model as psychiatrists, as therapists, how we can really help work with kids that have mental health concerns, that have depression in a very relatable way. Because I feel like what's awesome about this book is that it is approachable, but also accountable. So for those of you who have not picked up this book, please do. And you'll really get to know Dr. Terry as you're reading through the book. You feel his personality, you feel his style, and his ability to gently kind of keep at it, which is kind of what we have to do as, as psychiatrists. <laughs> So, you know, the 2021 Youth Risk Behavior Survey really has demonstrated how our youth are struggling. Um, women in particular, a lot of teenage girls struggling more than ever noted before. Uh, youth who have sex with the same sex as well. Um, but across the board, all youth are struggling with depression. This book was published in 2016, which means you've been dealing with this way before that. But it's still a pressing issue. What are some ways this book can be helpful to today's youth? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think that there's a myth out there perpetuated by various different movies that if you just sit on a couch once a week for 50 minutes and just have words come out of your mouth, then magical things will happen in the air. And then that's it. And then people will feel great. And they'll lead wonderful lives. And that's all it is. Vibrations from a vocal cord. And then boom, <laughs> magic happens, some powerful insider epiphany, and then everything is great. I don't think that's really how it works. Uh, I don't know, 98% of the time, I think that it's hard being a person. It's hard being a person on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to behave in ways that um, don't lead to happiness, joy, satisfaction, connection. There's mm -hmm. a lot of traps. Mm -hmm. And it takes uh, discipline and frequently choosing routines that support us. And so the goal of the book is to help people. One of the goals of the book is to help people get into these routines of getting enough sleep that we're not irritable and sad and exhausted and meditating. So we can actually focus our mind and get distance from our thoughts and not be reactive and feel happier and moving our bodies it's so easy to not move our bodies right there's a million fun sedentary things it's great and easy to be sedentary but it's not good for our physical health or our mental health so actually getting people to physically move their bodies and not just intellectually know that exercise is valuable you know knowing exercise is valuable does nothing for you knowing meditation is good useless if you're not actually meditating and exercising they do nothing for you so a lot of the book is like okay yeah everybody knows you know eat healthier and 
get more sleep and exercise, but actually doing it is what counts. So the goal of the book is to actually get people to do these things. Absolutely. Plus introduce people to the idea that how we think about things, our orientation, our attitudes, dramatically influences our experience of things. So to start getting people into that mode of learning how to change their thoughts, change their feelings, learning how to connect with people in real life. I mean, I did not foresee the pandemic at all in mm. any way. And I think the last chapter on the value of connecting with other people, um, particularly in real life, I think is more important than ever. It's so easy to just be in one's room on one's phone and just spend eight hours a day on a screen. And I think that's a terrible solution to feeling better and feeling engaged with the world. So that message is even more important to me now than before that we need to be in the room with people in real life and connecting and spending more time doing those kinds of things rather than just isolating and being on devices. Agreed. And, you know, I love that you kind of speak about how these basic things still need work, right? We still need to kind of practice and build those habits. And I think even as adults, maybe I should say, especially as adults, it's hard to break those habits, right? But for our youth who are still building those habits, sometimes we need to be reminded how. You know, my, my private practice is called uh, Do Better MD, and it's no better, do better, feel better. You can't feel better unless you actually do the action. You got to do better. <laughs> right. More than just the knowing, it's the action. So that's what I love about your book. So you make it bite-sized um, and attainable. I want to touch upon meditation, though, because I think sometimes uh, with mental health, lots of people are talking about meditation, but the action of it is sounds complicated. And I love that you just said it might be helpful to distance yourself from your thoughts because in psychotherapy, so often kids and therapists feel like we need to dig in. We need to get into those thoughts and work on those thoughts. And in some ways, meditation is quite the opposite. Tell us how meditation can be helpful. And for someone who struggles with depression, who's so mixed into their thoughts, why might this be a helpful tool? Yeah, so I could talk forever about meditation, but I'll try to be more concise so I think there are multiple ways in which meditation is extremely valuable. One is, as you were alluding to just now, when people don't have a consistent meditation practice, they can often become very fused with their thoughts. And if they have a thought, they assume it's true, which is not often the case. And they feel like they are their thoughts. And so the thoughts take on this gravity and this magnitude that really they don't deserve so if you're a 14 year old girl and you're attracted to someone and you're hoping they text you and then they don't text you back for like three hours you might have thought like they're not into me mm -hmm. maybe no one will ever be into me mm -hmm. my life's gonna suck right. and this would feel like the end of the world when really maybe they were just like taking a shower and doing their homework or they took a nap and it has nothing to do with you, but the thought feels so true. And so when you meditate, you get a lot more insight into how the mind works and you can just notice a thought and be like, that's, that's a ridiculous thought. Like, that thought is just totally not true. That thought popped out of my brain, but it's not true. Right. But you have to have that experience of observing a thought and being able to question it and see oh actually a lot of my thoughts are not true a lot of my thoughts are kind of negative or paranoid or mean or mean towards me judgmental like so that has a lot of value um another reason meditation is super valuable is even if a lot of people set an intention to concentrate on something without a meditation practice or being on some sort of medicine that helps attention it's very difficult i have a lot of patients that are like okay i want to stay in the moment but they're terrible at it because their mind wants to they have a monkey mind and their mind wants to run all over the place and think about terrible things that might happen in the future or things they regret in the past and then they can't they can't stay in the moment they're just incapable of it and so i think people intellectually buy into the idea yeah here and now present moment but if you can't do that it it's an irrelevant concept but when you sit for 10, 15 minutes every morning, every day, and you train your brain to stay in one place, it becomes much easier to stay in one place. And that has a ton of value. You know, there's tons of books written on the value of staying in the here and now, but you have to, you have to have the skill set to do it. So to just say to people stay in the here and now, it's like telling someone go run a marathon. 
yeah, this sounds nice. Go run 26 miles. If someone sits on the couch all day, every day, they're not going to get up and run 26 miles the next day. You have to start running. You have to start training. So we, I think training the mind has tremendous value, but you have to be willing to put in the work. And I, I love that you are so forgiving in your book, right? You encourage the experimentation, but not a rigidity that you have to do it a certain way, right? You give lots of options. And I think um, so, so many people when they're dealing with depression want to be told, well, what exactly do I have to do? And the answer is you have to find the way for you, right? You have to try different things. So um, I love you give great examples of that. Um, and Thank I think you. that um, in high school, right? I think therefore I am is this big philosophical revelatory thing. But then as an adult, you realize it's not really just the thinking, it is the observation of the thought that's actually liberating from who you are. It can help. Lead yeah. You who you are. And, and the feeling, I, I think feelings are where it's at. You know, if I just went to movies that made me think my life would be much drier. I just was at Sundance Film Festival. I like movies that make me feel I, there was a movie that I cried for like two hours straight. And I was like, this is beautiful. So think thoughts are nice, but feelings are often where it's at and thoughts and feelings are related. But yeah, to give, to give thoughts supremacy and assume if we have a thought, it must be true. is just absurd. So that, that leads into a part of your book that I really enjoy also, which is, I think helpful for both teens and youth and uh, parents, because it helps parents to understand how the teenage mind may work and how therapy can be kind of used for you and against you, right? Um, if you don't work on some things. And that, what I appreciate you calling out is really some resistance, right? You talk about terms such as outcome resistance, holding on to depression, entitlement. Now, all of these words as they are for the listener, they don't actually mean what they sound like. There's much more to that. So hopefully you are able to read the book and uh, understand what Dr. Terry means. But I think these are really important concepts that we don't often as therapists bring to the attention of the teenager, right? We're working around the resistance, but not really through the, that resistance. What have you found in teenagers can really be a barrier in terms of their thoughts to improving their mental health? Yeah, well, I want to give credit where credit is due. So one of my main mentors at Stanford is this guy named David Burns, who's a, a friend and a colleague, and he's still a, an emeritus professor of psychiatry at Stanford. And before I started learning with him, I probably like many people in the world kind of naively thought, well, if someone's depressed and they come to therapy, they must, they must just want to get better. If someone's anxious, they must want to get better. They want to get rid of all their symptoms. It just seems logical, right? Like who wants to suffer? So that was just how I thought about it. And then David opened my mind to this idea that often there's really good reasons people are doing what they're doing. It's serving them in some way and or it's saying wonderful things about them. So it's not as simple as just have them change a thought and then the depression will go away or have them change a thought and the anxiety will go away. It's, it's much more complicated. So mm -hmm. uh, outcome resistance is something we can all ask ourselves when we think we want to change in a certain way. We can think, okay, well, if I, if I had a magic wand and I could wave the magic wand and without any effort on my part, I could instantly have this outcome that I say that I'm wanting, what would be the reasons I might not actually want to be in that place, to be in the outcome? So if we stay with the topic of depression, um, let's say, for example, I'm depressed and I go to school maybe four days a week, four and a half days a week, and a lot of my friends are depressed and um, they're very sympathetic when I tell them about how terrible my parents are, or how mean my teachers are, or how crappy the other kids at school are, um, and I wear a lot of black and um, my some of my teachers are actually understanding that I turn things in late. Well, it might seem obvious I want to not be depressed, right? But, well, let's say my depression just went away instantly and I was kind of cheerful and happy-go-lucky. Well, there might be good reasons I don't want that. Maybe I'd question if my friend group will still have me because they identify as having mental health issues. Do they still want me if that's not my identity? Do I have to give up part of my identity? And will wearing black all the time seem dissonant with generally enjoying things. Do I have to get a new wardrobe? Will I feel like a phony if I wear black? What if I still like black? Is that weird? Right. Uh, 
I like skipping school sometimes. Now are people going to expect me to go to school because I'm not depressed? That sucks. That sounds burdensome. I like having a, a freebie sometimes. You know, uh, my teachers have been lenient. Sometimes I want to stay up and be on TikTok and turn stuff in late. Now do I have to turn stuff in on time? I don't know. Is, you know, is getting over depression all that it, it, it sounds like? So it's worth thinking about these things as therapists, as patients, what are what are reasons that we not may not necessarily want a particular outcome that we claim we want, and then really doing like a cost benefit analysis and thinking really critically. Well, with the benefits I'm getting from my current situation, what are the downsides? Where do I want to move? But to just naively think, oh, depression's bad. Let's instantly get over it. It's more complex. So I think the more time we spend thinking, what's the good in this? the easier it is paradoxically to move out of that if we want to move out of it. So that's worth thinking about. Um, entitlement. So I have a chapter in my book called Entitled Thinking, which is basically the topic of should statements. And I'm, I'm as guilty of this probably as most people, but we're all capable of getting into entitled thinking. We're all capable of thinking the world ought to be the way I want it to be every moment of every day. And we can get into this concept of fairness. I think fairness is actually a ridiculous concept. I can talk more about that if there's interest. Um, but basically, the world is not fair. By any possible way you could measure fairness, the world is not fair. The universe is not fair. Um, fairness is an illusion. Uh, and the more we hold on to it and, and expect everything to be fair and people to treat us the way we want and everything to be exactly the way we want it, the more disappointed and angry and resentful we will feel. That doesn't mean we can't vote and give money and do things to try to move the world in ways we want. I'm very pro social justice and things like that. But the more we expect everyone will constantly be acting to think about our interests and everything we want, just we're going to get frustrated and upset and disappointed. But the world, the, the universe doesn't care what we want, the, you know, the planet, the motions of the planets, they don't care what we want. The rain doesn't care what, whether we prefer other people in traffic don't care where we want to go and what time we need to get there. That's just not how things work. But when you can let go of that and be like, oh, actually, uh, most people are thinking about themselves and the people in their small little tribe. And that's okay. It's not all about me. I can let go of this attachment to things being exactly the way I want all the time. Uh, when we're in that space, we can accept things as they are much more and be happier. It's hard. It's hard. The brain, our ego constantly is popping up. Everything needs to be about me and be the way I want and oriented around me all the time. The ego loves to orient us that way. And it's, and then it's painful. So I, and this happened, you know, happened to me even this morning. So, uh, but when we can remember that and be like, oh, no, nope, life's not fair. And this is just the way things are. And more we can accept life on life's terms in general, the, the happier we'll be. And I think, you know, working with teenagers, they're at this position where they're <clears throat> developmentally learning, oh, the world is not about me, right? When you're a child, yes, everything is very egocentric, everything is about you. And then as you become a teenager, you widen your life experience and your views, supposedly, right? But even as adults, sometimes we can get very fixed on this idea of this is how it should be, needs to be, supposed to be. Um, yeah, so I agree with you. I think that we can get in our own way, you know? Um, yeah. And it, it's painful and humbling mm -hmm. almost whatever age you are to realize that it's not all about us. Right. It's actually very little about us. Most people are not out there thinking about us all the time when they're making decisions. They're not thinking about us, maybe a little bit, maybe occasionally, but they're usually thinking about themselves and that's okay. Cause we're that way too. So <laughs> The less we, the less attached we are to you, everyone's constantly thinking about us, the, the better it is. And I think for, you know, a parent or a young person listening to this, you know, we as psychiatrists, as therapists, we will talk about therapeutic alliance. And I think one of the reasons why that alliance can be so powerful is because that is one person that should be there for you, rooting for you, right? Your therapist and you engaging in that alliance that's one person who's on your side, who has your best interest at heart. <laughs> yes. They're challenging you, supporting you, and maybe even making things difficult for you as a yes. patient for your betterment. For yes. Your um, so I bring that up because for me, working with my teens, 
I've often come across teens who are so hopeless, they're so engaged in feeling that there is nothing else out there that it's really hard to work with them. And I think a lot of parents don't get to their kids until it's at that point, until it's that bad, right? So, you know, let's think it through. You have a 15-year-old female who's been struggling with depression for many years. She has been through many therapists, failed all these therapists, right? Failed all these antidepressant medications and says, nothing is going to help me. I'm here because my parents are making me, but there's nothing else I can do. I'm just existing. And honestly, I don't want to exist most days, you know? How might you approach this kind of a teen that seems to have already given up? Yeah, I definitely get those people coming into my office. Um, the only difference uh, between maybe some of the people I see and some of the people you see is that I have a screening process where I try to select for people that I'm most likely to help mm -hmm. and not take people that I'm unlikely to help. Mm -hmm. And, and a, the biggest factor for that for me is motivation mm -hmm. and willingness to put in effort. Yeah. And the earlier someone says, I'm not going to put in any effort, the, the quicker I am to say, I'm probably not the right person for you if you don't want to put in any effort. Including if people say, I'm only doing this for my parents. I don't want to see you like being forced to. So one of one of my so the usually the very first thing I tell teenagers, very first thing, is I say, you and I are scheduled to see each other two more times after today. And then you never have to see me again the rest of your life unless you enthusiastically want to see me. Mm. And so if for any reason after our last intake session together, you don't want to see me, I will not see you. Even if your parents were to beg, plead, coerce, or cajole me into seeing you, I will not see you unless you enthusiastically want to see me. So the next few sessions are as much a chance for me to get to know you and see if I think I have the skills to help you as it is for you to meet me and see if you think I'm someone that you like and you want to trust and work with. Right. How does that sound? And I have yet to meet a teenager who's like, no, that sucks. I want to be forced to see you. Everyone's like, yeah, that's good. I like having power and I like being told right. that it's up to you. Right. So usually people don't even get into my door if they're only there because their parents want to, because I'm screening that out um, through email. I'm doing free phone call, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So usually by the time they make it into my door, they already have said they want to see me. There's something independently about them that makes them want to see me. Mm -hmm. And they won't make it into treatment with me if it's because their parents want them to see me. So that's something I try to be really clear and tease out. Are you being pressured to see me? Is there a consequence if you don't see me, X, Y, Z happens? Is there some big reward if you see me? Or are you independently wanting to see me? And, and I've, I've had bad experiences when people have only been seeing me because there's some sort of carrot or stick if they see me or don't see me. I really want it to be that they independently have decided there's something they can get out of seeing me. That's what I want. So, so that alone has an anti-hopelessness quality to it, that I'm selecting for people that believe that if they see me, something good might happen. Mm -hmm. And I do that, I do that in a, in a, in a variety of ways. So, um, I don't have any diplomas on my walls. I don't talk about places I've gone, but sometimes people Google me and they see I've gone to various schools where I might know something. Um, I'm very fortunate. I've had wonderful clients and I have really good Yelp reviews. So sometimes people read the Yelp reviews and they're like, oh, a bunch of people felt hopeless and they came and saw this guy and now they have great lives and they're not wanting to kill themselves and they feel good. So often if people tell me they're hopeless, I'll often be like, just look me up on the internet, just read stuff, just see what you think. And that's often kind of inspiring for people. Mm -hmm. uh, even before they get into my office, be like, oh, other people also felt this bad and then made improvement. Um, but then with the hopelessness, I'll say, listen, I get that you're hopeless. You get to decide, are you willing to give me a chance? So you'll just have to do stuff right. and you're not going to know if it's going to work or not. So there's a little bit of faith involved. There's a little bit of trust involved. There's risk involved because right. I'm not going to make you a false guarantee that the moment you start sleeping more, you know, that day, you're going to feel way better. I'm not going to promise you the moment you start meditating, you're going to feel a lot better. 
because then you're going to think I'm a fraud and I, I would be a fraud to say that. But, but I can say, if you're willing to do everything I tell you to do, let me teach you how to meditate, meditate every single morning for 10, 15 minutes, uh, get as much sleep as your body needs. That might be nine hours for some people. It's even 10 hours for often people. It's all, it's at least eight hours. Um, for teenagers, uh, if you get adequate sleep, if you're moving your body, if you're spending less time on your phone, you're going to class, you're getting your homework done, you're spending time in real life with people, you're doing things you enjoy, some hobbies, not just social media, give it a chance. If you're willing to give it a chance, I think you'll be pretty pleased with read certain books, learn how to change your thoughts and feelings, do two hour sessions with me in person. If you're willing to do all those things, I think you'll be pleased with the results, but you have to be willing to give it a real shot. Like let's give it at least a month. And so everyone, it's not that often. Every once in a while, people hear that pitch and like, no, it's still not going to work. And there are probably, there's outcome resistance, right? There's holding on to depression. There's there's ways in which hopelessness is serving them. Right. Number one is protects them from disappointment. If they put their hopes on me, then it doesn't work. They're like, one less option out there. This sucks. I got my hopes up. I get disappointed. Maybe, easy, maybe easier to just stay hopeless. Nothing will work. Mm -hmm. but, but the vast majority of people hear that pitch and they're like, all right, what have I got to lose? A month of working hard and then I'm still miserable. And then often they do it and they're like, oh, actually, yeah, this does work. This is great. I do feel better. I'm making strides. I'm making progress. This is nice. I'm glad I took the risk. Awesome. Yeah, and I think that there are fluctuating levels of motivation that all of us have, right? So you have to kind of yeah. strike while the iron is hot and while they're effective <laughs> because that may wax and wane, right? So Absolutely, yes. And I, I think that's often why so many young people put so much hope on medication. So your book is called The Antidepressant Book, which is what drew me to the book. And we know if you, we read your book, there's so much other work than medication. Meds are not even mentioned in here, really, right? Like you're talking about all the other things to do. Um, so I'm just curious for you, because so many parents really want to avoid medications when it comes to depression. Yeah. We know that meds don't rework your thoughts. We know that meds don't guarantee that you will not attempt suicide. We know that meds have mixed evidence, and yet we still use them. Yes. So who do you think needs meds? What are some situations where you're working with a teenager um, on depression, using your methods, they are um, in your uh, sphere of influence, and you think maybe meds would be helpful? What are those types of kids? Or yeah, that's a great question. There are some conditions where people come in with me, and I'm like, 100% yes, meds. If someone comes in with me, and it's a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia, I think meds can be life-saving and dramatically helpful. And they're the number one treatment. If someone comes to me and they've had a true manic episode, they have bipolar disorder type one, it wasn't substance induced or drug induced, real manic episode, guaranteed, meds are great. I think for bipolar disorder, um, particularly if we're thoughtful about the medication use, medicines can be amazing. Uh, I've done a 180 on meds for ADHD compared to when I was young. I now I now think medications for ADHD can be so helpful. I use them very frequently. I think there's a lot of value in other things like meditation and getting enough sleep and executive functioning and organization and using a to-do list well and calendar. And meds are profoundly helpful. You've probably seen the same. Mm -hmm. So I think those are great. Uh, and then there's some situations in which I will almost never prescribe medications. If someone comes in and they only have, um, social anxiety, or they only have procrastination, or they only have a relationship challenge, um, I will never prescribe medication. Mm -hmm. And there's other situations where, you know, I'm sure you've seen this plenty of times where it's a gray area. Someone comes in with, um... Uh, well, well, other cases where I'll also do meds, if someone comes in with very, very severe depression, I will often, um, or mo moderate to severe obsessive compulsive disorder, mm -hmm. I will often be talking with the family about why I think there could be a lot of value to medication. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's also gray areas. If someone comes in with mild to moderate depression, mild OCD, um, mild to moderate generalized anxiety disorder. I'll often have an, an informed consent conversation with the patient and with their parents if they're under 18 and say, hey, 
here's the pros, here's the cons. There's advantages, there's disadvantages, there's potential side effects, potential gains. And with the, with the gains that you get, how much will you attribute to the medication versus how much will you attribute to the therapy in your own work? So I'll be kind of having a collaborative discussion with them about pros and cons. And it depends on the patient and it depends on the family. So some people say, hey, I'm in a really terrible place. I want to do everything right now that might work, including medication. And I'll say, yeah, we can do that. And let's talk about pros and cons. And other people say, why don't we try other stuff first and see if that works? And if it doesn't work well enough, let's consider medication. So that's a great option too. I'm totally open to that too. Um, so it depends on the exact situation and what the patient and the family are wanting from my perspective. So what I think is important for the listeners to hear is that even for those of us, like Dr. Tara and myself, who want to avoid medications as much as possible, there still are situations where it can be really helpful. And it's a case-by-case -case basis. But regardless of your choice of medication, really finding a good therapist on your team to really help you work through those thoughts that can perpetuate a lot of disabling symptoms is what you really need. Yeah. And, and one more um, additional comment I want to make about that. I have zero patients in my practice where I say, let's just put you on an SSRI mm -hmm. and make no other interventions. I, I It would be hard for me to imagine someone sitting in their room, being on their phone eight hours a day, alone, spending all their time with friends on their phone or on a screen, uh, not exercising, staying up late to get their homework done, sleeping in, missing some class, not meditating. And then you'd start Prozac or Zoloft and boom, life is great and everything's running, you know, magical and rosy. I've, ne I, I've never seen that. It's hard for me to imagine there are cases like that. So I think if, if medication is going to be used, it should be, you know, part of a, a whole package of other things. So I feel bad for these pediatricians out there that have, you right. know, yes. 10,000 kids and they have five minutes with the person like, uh, here's some Lexapro, you know? So I, I feel for them, but should that be the only wrench? I think, I think that's almost never should be the only so if you if you want to consider it amongst many other things, yes. But one of my messages is don't find a psychiatrist who will meet with you for eight minutes and then say, here's your medicine. Come back and see me in a month or three months. Right. Don't do anything else different. I think that's a terrible message. And I think my want want message for you teens and adults out there is the bad news is it's going to be very rare that you'll, you can just pop a pill every day and then it, your life's magical and amazing. But the good news is that might be part of a package that makes your life much more rich and enjoyable and full and great. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about, uh, have you talk a little bit about electronics ectomy, which is a phrase you have in your book and you've referred to kind of screen and online use to be um, kind of a perpetuating factor for being stuck. So speak to us about that. Yeah, so a friend of mine and a colleague, Anna Lemke, she was one of my favorite attendings when I was at Stanford for residency, and she's become a friend over the years. She wrote a great book called Dopamine Nation, which is in bookstores everywhere now. And it's all about how tempting it is for all of us to get our dopamine hits from these different places, including what she calls the modern hypodermic needle, our smartphones that we have on us at all times, and, you know, the moment we're bored, we reach for our phone. And these devices are so seductive and they are so alluring and tempting and they want to draw us in for every possible moment they can. And if we're not intentional, we can waste a ton of time on these devices and we can stay up late and we can you know, if we're not a teenager, we can watch one more episode on Netflix or Hulu or Prime Video or Max or whatever it is. And, oh, I'll just go to bed a little later. Um, <clears throat> if you're young, everything's on your phone. Uh, and it's tempting. It's tempting to procrastinate and be like, I'll just do it later. But then people stay up later and later and later. And they're going to bed at one in the morning, two in the morning, four in the morning. And then they're a mess. And then they either skip class or they just cut down on sleep. I, I can't, I'm sure you've seen these, 
cases. I can't even tell you. And people are sleeping like five hours a night, six hours a night, every weeknight, just barely getting by. And it's a terrible existence. It's miserable. It's far from optimal for ability to concentrate, be happy, physical health. Everything suffers when people cheat on sleep. But it's it's tempting to do. So the electronic sectomy is... One, you have to make a conscious decision if you want to prioritize sleep. So I have people do a cost-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to prioritize sleep? It's not going to happen on its own. It's not going to magically happen that you're going to turn off all your devices and go to bed at nine or 10. That doesn't happen to anybody. You know, almost nobody's just naturally tired if they're right in front of a screen that's suppressing the melatonin. So you have to decide, is sleep a priority for me or is sleep not a priority for me? That's the biggest decision. Uh, and look at the evidence. You have to gather data. How do I do when I'm well-rested and how do I do when I'm not well-rested? And you have to really examine it critically. But if you make that, and I've run that experiment many times and turns out, I mean, <laughs> that's why I'm sick right now. I was at Sundance and snowboarding and I chose movies over sleep and now I'm sick. Uh, so, but in general, when I'm here in California, I choose a lot of sleep. I sleep like nine, 10 hours a night, you know, almost every night. I, I run the experiment. My life goes better when I sleep more and my life goes worse when I cheat myself on sleep. So I've decided it's a priority. So, so everyone has to run that experiment. But once you run the experiment, then you have to figure out how much sleep do I does my brain need? And people are different. The average for teenagers, you know, nine hours a night. Some people are lucky. They can get by less, seven or eight. Other people need 10. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out, you know, so if you're a teen listening to this, here's a way you can do it. When you're on vacation for a long time, maybe like a week or more, and you're already caught up, you don't have a sleep deficit, you're well-rested, how long do you sleep when there's no alarm? How long do you sleep? And then to wake up, be well-rested. So figure that out and then prioritize that amount, right? So maybe it's nine hours uh, on average. So let's say you have to wake up at seven to you know make it to school on time, count back you know, nine hours. So that'd be like 10 PM. Okay. So if you're going to try to fall asleep at 10, then maybe around nine, nine 30 should be your electronic sectomy. So mm -hmm. nine, nine 30, another 30 to 60 minutes before your bedtime, if your bedtime is 10, no screens, nothing. So that means you take all of your de devices and charge them out of your room. So I'm a big fan of getting devices out of the bedroom iPhones, iPads, laptops, everything, not in the bedroom. TV included, uh, right? We'll say it again. TV included? TV included. Do not do not have a TV in your bedroom. It is bad sleep hygiene. Don't get, get the TV out of your bedroom. Move it somewhere else. Watch TV somewhere else. Bed is great for sleep and sex, and that's it. Don't use the bed for anything else. Don't read in bed. Don't do your homework in bed. Don't hang out in bed. No, bed is for sleep and sex. That's it. Everything else, do somewhere else. Uh, honestly, I think even just trying to keep the bedroom in general, just for, just for sleep is good. Don't do other things. There's other places you can do stuff. Um, so get the electronics out and then give your brain a little time to secrete melatonin and relax and unwind before you go to bed, probably at least 20, 30 minutes. And you can brush your teeth, wash your face, meditate, read, do art, whatever, then go to bed. And then if people actually do that, the other reason I like that is if you have a hard stopping point in electronics, it motivates you to not procrastinate because right. particularly if you're a teenager and you need to hit submit on that quiz or that test or that assignment, if you actually stick to that, that's going to motivate you to start work at maybe four instead of 830 right. or when you're debating whether to do TikTok or not, be like, oh, okay, I know I have a hard stop. I got to get stuff done. So there's, I think there is really value in prioritizing things like sleep, exercise, meditation, going to class, and then everything else fits within that rather than I'll do my homework when I feel like it, and when it gets done, I'll sleep. And then I think that's a very dangerous lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to ask you about the cover of your book. Why parrot fish? <laughs> so Christmas, 2015, uh, I went scuba diving. I was on the Great Barrier Reef on a liveaboard with my best friend at the time. We went under in the morning and saw this school of maybe 15 huge fish. Like, I don't even know if the camera can capture, like huge fish. They were like 200 pounds each. And they were these weird looking creatures with these big bumps. And I'd never seen anything like them. And they were these parafish and they would 
they would bump into the the rocks and they would bump the rocks and then eat them and turn them into dust. Uh, fun trivia fact: If you've ever been on, if, have you ever been on a white sand beach before? So Not so. Really. Okay, so anyone watching this, if you've ever been on a white sand beach, uh, you're walking on parrotfish poop. So all white sand is parrotfish poop. So they crush up these um, rocks and then turn into poop. Um, that's where white sand, so fun fact. So uh, I, I did a recent little research in bumper parrotfish. I was kind of fascinated by these things. And they're cool. They, you, they use them to like, you know, have dominance and fight with other fish and break up these rocks. And my friend, Anna Hirsch, was working on the art for the book. And she'd come up with this cool mock-up of these boxers. There was a metaphor for kind of fighting the shadow and depression. Mm -hmm. She had a great mock-up. But I looked at it and I was like, it's too dark. I don't love it. I was like, but I don't know what else to do for the cover. And I said, Anna, this has nothing to do with depression. But I was just swimming with these, you know, wacky creatures called bump-headed parrotfish. Could you do a mock-up? So then bump -headed parrotfish. And she's like, sure. And a couple of days later, she comes back to me and I was like, this is fantastic. I love it. This is great. Nothing to do with depression. But the way she did it actually, it ended up kind of having something to do with depression. I didn't even tell her to do this. She just spontaneously did this. On the cover, you got this kind of lonely, mm -hmm. isolated fish just kind of hanging out by itself. And then by the time you get to the back, when you're done reading the book, it's got some friends and they're kind of yeah. heading toward the light and they're moving yeah. in a good direction. I didn't even, I didn't think about that. Before. I was like, I love it. Anna just did a brilliant job. So it's just kind of a wacky evolution. The perk of being a self-publisher, you can just make your own decisions yeah. and do what you want. But that's the, that's the story of the bump-headed pair of fish. And, and like they're doing something hard. They're coming up that's against true. something hard. Depression is hard. It takes a lot of work. But if you're consistent, you're able to build a beautiful white sand beach, right? I like that. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just add me in here. Well, That's I great. have so appreciated talking to you. Is there any other things in the works that we should be looking forward to from you? There is a secret project secret. Um, okay, that may happen. Um, I... Uh, we'll have more information for you probably in the next month or two, but awesome. there might be something else in the works. Um, well, actually, and separate from that, there is something in the works that I'm excited about that is going to happen for sure in March. So I enjoy, I want to also give a shout out to another mentor of mine, Margot Tienemann. She is this brilliant child psychiatrist. She was one of my mentors at Stanford. And she's like the only child psychiatrist that is well-trained and well-versed in everything. She's like really brilliant at psychodynamic psychotherapy, but also cognitive behavioral therapy and family-based treatment for anorexia and nervosa. And we did dialectical behavior therapy training, like the full, like gold standard DBT training. And she's really, she just knows everything. And she's like warm and funny and humble. So I love Margot. So she said to me, she said, you know, I don't really like cleaning bathrooms very much. So I don't want to go like volunteer and like clean bathrooms, but I like doing therapy with people and I like helping people this way. So I'm going to have my charity be like, see people for free sometimes. Mm. And that's going to be kind of my, my form of charity and my way of giving back. She's like, so please, when you, I, I was in training at the time, she's like, when you do your career, do some amount of like pro bono work, sliding scale work. And I was like, yes, like, absolutely. That's, that's brilliant. And what, why not do that? There's right. a lot of people that can't afford what we're offering so so that really stuck with me that that's very valuable to keep doing pro bono side skill stuff so for a long time i was doing one-on-one -on -one pro bono stuff for people we usually do these like 20 hour intensives and i loved it it was very rewarding it was very satisfying i was even able to turn it into like a teaching opportunity i sometimes have people like trainees come and learn and that was fun right. um and recently i've been thinking like well how can i have more of an impact on the world like how can i go bigger and we just started doing this thing called Finding Humans Less Scary. So we're going to do our second round in March, March 16th to 17th, 2024. And we're going to have 100 people come for free cool. and work on their social anxiety. So awesome. a lot of people suffer from social anxiety. Yep. And it's a very lonely condition. And a lot of people, it, it affects their love life and um, makes them feel isolated. So uh, we did it a year ago and it was really fun and very helpful to a lot of people so we're gonna do it again so if people 
if this airs before, you know, March 17th, we're, but we're capping 100 people. So it's first come, first serve, okay. findinghumanslessscary.com. Mm -hmm. So people need to give a $20 or more donation to one of the charities listed on the website, but we came up with some diverse charities. Uh, but then people are going to get 15 hours of high quality treatment for social anxiety for no additional cost beyond the $20. Okay. So I think that's going to be really fun. We've got like 10 therapists coming in, some even flying in, and we get people flying in from various states. So people want to do that, findinghumanslessscary.com, they can register there. Awesome. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that amazing opportunity. I do hope some listeners take you up on that um, and fly out to California and see you. Um, how can people stay in touch with you, follow you? Ah. <sighs> Well, I have a website, jacobtoweremd.com, which I update at least like once every several years. You know, I'm really <laughs> prolific. I, I am so ambivalent about social media. I'm so ambivalent. Um, I I know I'm sure there would be some benefits to me being like a prolific content creator, but I have tremendous resistance. I have process resistance to putting effort into social media. So how how can people follow me? Uh, well, if they want to be my patient, they can, you know, come see me. So they can sign up at jacobtowerimd.com. Um, they could, you could come surfing with me. I'm getting into surfing. You could come down to Santa Cruz and cool. we can surf together. But yeah, I don't, uh, I may, I may have a new book, you know, that I'm going to work on. So you could, you could read the book. You could oh. read my, my first book, but that's it for now. Well, you have a wonderful oh. website and a wonderful book, which is a fantastic contribution to teenagers and parents. So I hope any of you dealing with these issues pick up this book and read it and visit his website. Um, do you have two minutes to do a rapid closeout? Yeah, let's do two minutes. Yeah. All right, two minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, just going to ask you some quick questions, quick answers. Sure. What are the top three things you wish you knew before you became a psychiatrist? One, it's awesome. So I should do it. Two, um, if you run your own practice, there are some administrative things you have to do that are kind of annoying, mm -hmm. but still very worth it. Uh, three, super, super rewarding. So great field and glad I chose it. Awesome. What is the best advice you've ever been given? Be kind. When in doubt, kind. Dalai Lama. Awesome. Um, and if you could end these uh, phrases, the most important thing in life is? Love. The most rewarding thing about being a psychiatrist is? Helping other people transform their lives. I wish my struggling clients knew that. Their current state is temporary and they can get to a place where they feel dramatically better. And finally, the future of mental health care will be? Helping people get into and stay in very healthy routines and spend a lot less time on screens. Mm. Dr. Jacob Towery, thank you so much for your time and contribution today on my podcast and sharing your wisdom and encouragement. Thanks again for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Awesome. Take care. Be well. You too.